The construction of the Lachine Canal in Griffintown had been planned and attempted for more than a century before its successful execution. Due to technological deficiencies, war, and general lack of funds, the attempts at modernizing the area from an agricultural region to that of something more consistently met with failure. The original owner of the land, Thomas McCord, was overseas when his land was illegally sold to Mary Griffin, who turned the region from an agricultural space into a low-cost housing zone. This area welcomed Irish immigrants, as they were fleeing the potato famine at the time, and the population radically increased. Upon McCord's return, the land was significantly changed, and it wasn't until a decade-long legal battle ended that he regained the land in 1814. By this time, the land had been developed without him, and the name Griffintown had stuck. In 1821, the Lachine Canal's construction began, and a new age of heavy industrialization started, which reshaped the entire area into what would eventually become the largest industrial neighborhood in the country. Through theft, rapid development, and the implementation of new transportation technology at this economically strategic location, it laid the groundwork for the Lachine to become a commercial hub over the 19th century. The workers of Griffintown were quite poor, and the Irish Protestant and Catholic workers were subject to such abject conditions that they engaged in the first and bloodiest large-scale labor demonstrations Canada has ever seen. Physical confrontations occurred regularly between the managers and employees for many years, the longest lasting 20 days. The area was wrought with violence and disaster. This included religious violence, to class violence, to fires that, that consumed much of the wooden architecture, and an annual flooding that destroyed their foundations. In addition to this, attempts to enlarge the canal were met with such difficulty that the whole project was eventually privatized, and the harsh conditions worsened with no improvement for many decades. The second phase of canal expansion, from 1843 to 1848, allowed the land to develop into a powerful magnet, attracting large-scale, technologically advanced industries, large capital investments, and the development of inter-industry linkages that helped Canada to become an exporter of manufactured goods worldwide. The value of the land, over 20 years, from 1851 to 1871, octupled, and with it, wages eventually improved. After the third stage of, of Lachine expansion from 1874 to 1885, Griffintown was an engine for industry in flour and sugar, metalworking, shoes, textiles, chemical plants, and the brewing industry with the Lachine as its power. Griffintown was created by modernization, immigration, and a bit of charisma on Mary Griffin's part. But as it was created by modernization, it was also destroyed by it. As the Lachine was used to improve the scale of industrial transportation, it was eventually replaced by the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959, effectively making the Lachine obsolete and Griffin Town an entirely unnecessary pit stop on the way to larger sites of industrial import and export. The St. Lawrence Seaway turned the land from an area of 60,000 people to less than 600 in a few decades due to loss of employment and deindustrialization. This process was so rapid that after only 11 years since the, the Seaway's opening, the machine was shut down entirely, with the St. Lawrence Seaway being five times longer and six times deeper, and connecting naval transit from the Atlantic all the way to the furthest of the Great Lakes. The seaway uses a series of locks and canals, and is connected to numerous hydroelectric dams that not only has fundamentally reshaped Montreal, but has also reshaped other environments with which it interacts with. The seaway has created entire new lakes and, and communities, while destroying others. The seaway necessitated the relocation of highways, nine small communities, and it flooded 15,400 hectares of land while relocating 6,500 people, not including Griffintown. Its effect cannot be understated, and, and while the economic cost of this expansion of transportation has been entirely recovered by enabling the exploitation of vast iron ore deposits in Quebec and Labrador, it aptly shows how modernization both creates and destroys entire communities.